Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage. If this is the first time you're stopping by the channel, there's a playlist of the fourth season that we're currently working on. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, well, most of them anyway, we're gonna be here and we're gonna be chatting about something large format. I'm so sorry I missed you guys last Friday. Filling orders for the print sale and life in general uh, are kind of getting ahead of me. This is the time of year, full disclosure, where I'm working a little bit extra hard because I'm also teaching some classes out of Midwest Photo. So if you want to learn more about your digital stuff, some video, or maybe do a one-on-one -on -one in the darkroom space, you can learn more about those at mpex.com forward slash learn. A little shameless plug. Anyway, today's topic is a really neat one because it involves something that someone sent to the LFF inbox. If, in case you didn't know, if you wanted to donate something to the show, write a letter, sure, just send anything in, you can send that to LFF, P.O. Box 44684, Columbus, Ohio 43204, USA. And one such thing showed up a few weeks ago and it's still kind of blowing my mind that it made it all the way here. Let me show you. This, okay, well, not just this, but this is a glass plate negative. And this came all the way from Edinburgh, Scotland. It traveled almost 4,000 miles to get here. And while that doesn't sound particularly impressive, it's a very thin two millimeter sheet of glass. And in a day and age where I can't even get a postcard across town without something happening to it, a piece of thin glass making it all the way here is a triumph. So thanks Royal Mail and thanks to Roger from Scotland who sent this. Along with this glass plate, Roger sent some pretty interesting recommendations for an LFF topic. And he brought up some really great points that I really haven't talked about here in nearly four seasons of LFF. And that is, what do we do about different or non-standard large format sizes? And let's start with this guy. Now, I shoot a lot of eight by 10 inch film on the channel, but this actually is an eight by 10. Let me go grab a negative. So this is an eight by 10 C41 negative. It's one I took back in Hocking Hills a long time ago. And then this is Roger's plate. And I keep saying plate because it's a glass plate, but also because this isn't a, an eight by 10 inch glass plate. This is a whole plate. Now, whole plate is one of a series of portrait camera plates from back in the plate camera days. A whole plate is technically six and a half inches by eight and a half inches. The way I like to think of a whole plate nowadays is it's iPad size. So if you have a full size iPad, the screen area of that is roughly the same size as a whole plate. But whole plate wasn't the end of it. In fact, this was the largest size available for many portrait companies. So if we were to take our whole plate, go by the long end and run it down the middle, that would give me two half plates. If I would then run another line down the middle the other way, that would give me four quarter plates. Now this is where things get tricky. You can also get sixth plates, which are two cuts along the long end and one along this end. We have quarter plates, sixth plates, ninth plates, and then 16th plates. So in addition to all these other different funky plate sizes of film, there's a whole world of film sizes that aren't four by five, five by seven, and eight by 10. My apologies that I don't know these off the top of my head because there's just so many of them. And here they go. We've got two by three, three by four, three and a quarter by four and a quarter, three and a quarter by five and a half, four by five, four and a quarter by six and a half, four and three quarter by six and a half, four and a half by five and a half, four by 10, five by seven, five by eight, seven by 17, eight by six, eight by 10, 10 by 12, eight by 20, 11 by 14, 12 by 20, 14 by 17, 16 by 20, 20 by 24, and then mammoth plates up above that. We also had six and a half by nine, centimeter sheet film, nine by 12 centimeter sheet film, 10 by 15 centimeter sheet film, 13 by 18 centimeter, 18 by 24 centimeter, and 24 by 30 centimeter. That's a whole lot of film. It's really easy to forget that large format photography is the original photography. It's how we took an image and fixed it onto a sheet of paper, a glass plate, and eventually a piece of flexible film. Before we started seeing mass production of cameras out of Rochester and other places around the world, there were very few standards going around. And even the way we held film and plates in place has changed over time. 
We started with these things called plate holders because we needed to hold these glass plates in place. A lot of times they had these giant pressure springs and you can still purchase plate holders that look like these today. We also had book form plate holders, which could open from a hinge on either the long side or the short side of the film holder. It all depended on design. But in all of that, we still didn't have a way to guarantee that a film and a holder from one camera could match a film and a holder from another. All of this changed in the late 19-teens. In 1917, with the foundation of the DIN, or the German National Standards Institute, and the ANSI in 1918, the American National Standards Institute. Now, most of the gear that I'll find here in North America has some backing in ANSI standards. And if you're in Europe, you might have something that conforms to the DIN, which anymore, all of them will conform to the same ISO, or International Standards Organization, so we don't have to worry so much about that. But if you're getting into vintage gear, gear that you know is older than the 1900s, you may have to watch out for film holders and sometimes plate sizes that don't conform to today's standards. Before we get too far into it, ANSI, DIN, and ISO standards apply across the board to the following film sizes. 4x5, 5x7, 8x10, 11x14, and 14x17. So if you're dealing with cameras and holders within those sizes, chances are you're good, but it's not a guarantee. All the resources I used in looking up this information, I'm gonna put in the description below because there's a few really handy charts for measuring your own film holders. Or let's say you wanted to make your own film holder that conforms to these standards, check out the links in the description below. So I've got my eight by 10 inch Takahara. This is an eight by 10 inch double extension folding field camera. And I have here a modern eight by 10 plastic film holder. Uh, this is a Fidelity Elite, uh, Fidelity Deluxe, Lisco Regal, Toyos. These are all gonna be very much the same. Plastic body, plastic dark slide, I'd open it up, but there's some Delta 100 in here that I gotta shoot in the field here pretty soon. Uh, but when I place this in my holder, it's gonna push all the way in until we hit this rib lock that's right on the side here. I'm gonna pop that in and we're ready to go. I'll pull the dark slide, expose my film, you know, the whole dance. When I'm done, it's gonna pull out just fine. So when I was trying to shop around for some examples of non-standard film holders, I came across a wooden holder that was kind of suspect. And it was this one right here. Uh, for those of you that already shoot 8x10, you might be familiar with these. Uh, this is actually an Eastman Kodak wooden holder. And this one you can even see has all of the original Kodak patent information on there. But this wooden holder looks a little bit fishy compared to my other 8x10 holder. In fact, this one, the wooden holder, is a little bit shorter. But that's the only place this film holder differs. While it doesn't necessarily look good or feel good in the film back of my camera, it seats very close in. So to get it out, I have to do a significant amount of prying and I could even bend this metal dark slide. This film holder is actually specced for ANSI standards because it was a patented Eastman Kodak, but it's not a guarantee. If you find a holder that looks really old, really wooden, doesn't have many markings on it, uh, and might just be a little bit thicker in some dimensions, chances are it is not gonna conform to the standards there. You'll have to look at all of those other little details. For this one specifically, I had to look at the width and make sure that was standard, and I also needed to check the distance to this rib lock here. That's what locks it in to the back of the camera, and it turns out this one was standard. I got really lucky in that. But if you're working in things like ULF sizes or any of those other funky sizes we talked about today, you're kind of working in the Wild West again because we're dealing with very niche cameras that weren't mass produced. So what do we do about this whole standard situation? What if you get a holder and you're not sure that it meets the specification? Well, you can cross check those links I have down below in the description. Those are gonna have very fine details on all sorts of dimensions of the film holder. The most critical dimensions of your film holder are of course gonna be the width, the distance to this rib lock right here, and then another very important distance which is called your T distance. This is the distance that the light has to travel down from the top of the film holder to the film plane. You're also gonna have things like the flap and all sorts of stuff. These are very critical dimensions, all of which are covered in the various specifications, ANSI, DIN, and now ISO. So go ahead and check those. Without proper fit of specifications, even if it feels like it might be good, 
if you don't have the proper depth or the right locking amount, any small thing that could be off and is out of tolerance might result in a fuzzy picture, a light leak, and really just a whole set of headaches when you're trying to take pictures. My best advice is to find something pretty modern. Plastic holders with plastic slides from a major brand name, Fidelity, Lisco, uh, Toyo, Rightway, the list goes on. If it's boutique made, doesn't have branding, or doesn't have any sort of indication that there was a patent that it conforms to, yeah, that might be a red flag. If you're still gonna shop for wooden holders that you suspect might be okay or conform to the standard, you're not out of the woods yet. You may also have issues in regards to old or fraying tape or light seals on there. This wood, especially near the end, is gonna get really flimsy over time. You may have other things like warping of the wood or bending. The best I can recommend is, when in doubt, don't cheap out on film holders. If you're not sure, yeah, you can spring for a brand new film holder. At the time of recording, your options are like Toyo and Chamonix, which are both like, they're awesome holders, don't get me wrong, but they're very, very expensive compared to what you might find on the used market. Find a nice used one, or if you're shopping for a vintage ULF camera, make sure it comes with all the accessories you need. A lens that covers, a camera body with a light tight bellows, and some holders that you know will fit, or holders that were bought for it. So, now that we're armed with all of this new information on film holders, plate sizes, and different film formats that exist in large format photography, what do we do? Well, if you're just getting started in large format, my advice really hasn't changed throughout the seasons. Start with a four x five, preferably. If you don't wanna do four x five, consider five x seven or eight x 10. These three are all conforming to ANSI, ISO, and DIN standards, and they're the easiest to find gear for. Lenses, film, cameras, you name it. All the other formats kind of make up the ULF spectrum, all the way from two by three inch plates all the way up to 20 by 24 and the mammoth plates beyond that. If the camera you're looking at predates the 1900s or you're making it yourself, you do have the opportunity to find something that might conform to the standard, but chances are it won't. I also have a link in the description below to a post from Mr. Richard Ritter, who's a fantastic ultra large format camera maker. He makes some super lightweight cameras. He has a really nice table on his website of different standards within ULF, some which conform to ANSI, ISO, and others which don't, but these are what he has found and he kind of put everything together. And to round out today's episode, I wanna take this awesome plate that Roger sent from Edinburgh. Uh, this is a specific scene in Edinburgh that is very, very common. It's got the castle uh, in the background. I wanna do something special with this, so I'm gonna go ahead and start printing out a calotype print. Calotype, or I actually never learned the correct pronunciation of it, but the one with the K. The one that isn't C-A-L-O, the one that's K-A-L-L-I. The one that I've been doing on the channel here for a while. So I'm gonna take this into the dark room, coat up prints, and uh, we'll see what we can get with it. Over the last few months, I have been obsessed with the calotype printing process. Right now I'm mixing up the sensitizer. This is a simple two-part sensitizer. I have equal parts ferric oxalate, that's the green stuff, and equal parts silver nitrate. I found about 13 drops works best for this whole plate. There's my galvanized plate and some magnets to hold down that curly, hand-torn Hanamula paper. Just drying off my hockey brush here. It's a little damp from some distilled water, and I'm just dropping that on, and I'm gonna start evenly brushing things on. Up, down, left, and right. Just make sure I've got everything in that area a little bit larger, just coated so I can see all those nice brush strokes. This is my favorite part of the process. It really never gets old. All right, once we're done, I'm gonna let that dry for a few minutes. Taking a look at our plate here, this is a little bit thinner than a Pyrocat negative. It's gonna need some special treatment underneath the light here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sandwich that down. I'm gonna place a piece of glass on top of it to make sure nothing curls, keep it nice and sharp. And over the course of my exposure here, I'm also gonna need to dodge a little bit because this negative is not contrasty enough for a normal alt print, but we can affect that with both our developer and that dodging I did during my three minute exposure. And there we go. Oh man, this is just so much fun. I love it. Uh, thanks again, Roger, for sending in this uh, this awesome glass plate, and I was uh, kind of happy to have a have a different type of photo than my normal frickin' trees. Thanks again for stopping by. If you have any questions about 
film holder sizes, plate sizes, or standards, you can always feel free to drop those down below in the comments. And for those long form questions, you can shoot me an email, largeformatquestions at gmail.com. Thanks again for stopping by and we'll catch you next week for more LFF.